Welcome everybody, welcome to St Paul's Church. Uh, lovely to be together this morning. Uh, my name's Sam Ashton, uh, I'm the minister here at our church family. A lovely welcome to our church family and uh, if you're just visiting us, maybe off the back of Easter, a very warm welcome to you as well as we, as we uh, explore who Jesus is. And we're so excited to have John Tuckwell with us, who's the vicar up the road at Christ Church. John, thank you so much for coming. You are a dear friend to us and we love the family up at Christchurch and the way that you've encouraged us and served us with, through music and policies and behind the scenes and all of that. We are so thankful and we'll be interviewing John in a little bit, finding out a bit more. Uh, now, we, we meet together as a family for about an hour this morning. As a family, we love to sing praises to God. And so the words that we need will be up on the screen. We love to talk to God. And there are words for us to join in with when we pray, they'll be in bold. Uh, we love to listen to God and we've got Bibles at the end of our pews and as young, as young and old together as a family we spend all our time together apart from when we split into our separate teaching and the children will head out this way and there's a crash if we need to to get back round the other sides and there are little service packs for under 11s um, as well and, and then we have the joy of celebrating the Lord's Supper together at the end and do stay for tea and coffee afterwards as we filter through to the hall as we continue to encourage each other. Now hear these words from a man in the Old Testament called Job. Job went through a, a very hard time and yet he had deep confidence and he said these words that are going to be on the screen. Hello. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth and after my skin has been destroyed yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Now the Lord Jesus is alive. We've got our wonderful Easter garden reminding us of Jesus' is, Jesus is risen. And one day his friends, we will see him face to face. And today as we gather, we are one day closer. I'm going to pray as we begin. Blessed are you. Lord God of our salvation, to you be praise and glory forever. As once you ransomed your people from Egypt and led them to freedom in the promised land, so now you have delivered us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your risen Son. May we, the first fruits of your new creation, rejoice in this new day you have made and praise you for your mighty acts. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Death beats all sinful humans, but sinless Jesus beats death. Jesus wins. We win with Jesus. All the glory goes to him. We're going to begin by putting all the glory on Jesus in thine be the glory. There are some fun trumpets in there as well. Please stand as you're able. Give all the glory to Jesus as we sing.
and say, uh, <laughs> an abrupt ending. We stand to declare our faith in the risen Lord Jesus. These words here we're using from 1 Corinthians 15. So we say together, together we say, now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And therefore, continuing from 1 Corinthians 15, we say, you you say the words in bold, I'll start us. Death is swallowed up in victory. Where, Where, O death, is your sting? Christ is risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Death is swallowed up in victory. The trumpet will sound, and the dead shall be raised. Where, O death, is your sting? We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your sting? We're going to continue praising God for his victory over death. We've sung this song before, but if it is unfamiliar, do feel free just to listen, whether that's standing or sitting.
much that you have defeated death and the grave and we have life forever with you. Amen. Please do take a seat. Because of the work of the Lord Jesus in his death and resurrection, we are a family and we travel with Jesus to see Jesus face to face. Uh, why not turn to a neighbour near you, welcome them on this Sunday morning. Uh, and why not ask, uh, what is one thing you enjoy about being part of the church family? Maybe one thing you enjoy being part of the church family. Uh, take a moment to welcome each other. What's, what's one thing anyone want to share? One thing they enjoy being part of the church family. Being with fellow Christians, yeah, brothers and sisters, isn't it? What a joy. A new family. Um, uh, yes, the waters of baptism are thicker than blood. Yeah, what a joy to be together. A any, anything else? Yes, JJ, did you have something? No, you're okay. Oh, one other. On the same journey, what a joy. Yeah, thank you, Sally. There are lots of other things to are thinking about, aren't there, of being uh, part of the family all together. And here are some family notices, ways that we can live well as a family this week. Uh, the first thing to flag up is, um, as a family, we have the joy of calling God our Father, and we get to talk to our Father any place, any time, anywhere. We particularly gather as a church family um, to be able to pray on Wednesday, the 24th of April. It's the last Wednesday of every month, seven o'clock uh, at our house round the corner. Um, do welcome you all there to join. We've also got coming up our big church family meeting. It's a real celebration to thank God for all that he's been doing in us and through us and among us this past year. A date for your diary is Sunday the 19th of May. And away within the Church of England that we, we say, this is my church. I want to be all in. I want to play my part within the family in uh, praying and coming along regularly and using the gifts God has given me to serve the church family. The way we go all in is something called the electoral roll. Electoral roll. Um, if we don't know if we're on that list, there are a list of names at the back for us to check. If we'd like to be, if maybe we started coming along for a period of time, beyond six months, we've been coming along, we'd love to join, then there are some forms at the back to join the electoral roll. Another thing about the church family meeting, for those who have been asked to write any reports, whether that's in life groups or impact fund, whatever that happens to be, their deadline has been and gone. If we still need to do them, it'd be great to do them this afternoon, to be able to send them in, uh, send them in to, uh, to uh, admin at stpaulshadleywoods.org. Now we have a little interview. Alice is gonna come and interview John. If I could invite you both up. Here we are, why don't you? Good morning, church family, and good morning to you. Good morning. Oh, you've got a microphone already. I have. And what is your name for those who've never known this random guy? Here we are. I am John without an H. Interesting. Jonathan to my mother, but just to my mother. <laughs> so I shouldn't call you Jonathan. Just John. Um, John and I met before um, Sam and I met. Yeah, a long time ago. When I was young and fresh. Uh, and you were young and fresh. Uh. Yeah. I had hair and everything. <laughs> um, John, why are you here today? A bit, well, because we, we love this. It, we have this wonderful partnership between Christchurch and St Paul's. And I hope today is just a, a little expression of that partnership. It's a joy hearing regularly from Sam and Alice what God is doing here. And um, be assured God is at work up the road as well. Our first question. Oh. We were talking about what do we enjoy about being a church family here. Is there something that has encouraged you about your church family at Cockfosters? Yes. 
so many things. I was standing at the back of our 915 service this morning as it started, and um, and I buried their daughter a couple of weeks ago. She was 24. They they come on to hear they sense that maybe just cradle to coffin, but that's the whole story. There's there's more beyond. There's another guy there, him to three and a half years ago. He's got kids. He the woman six months ago, and uh, been trying to with him and pastor him to support his wife. in church, listening to words from John 4, Jesus offering uh, water that will quench his thirst. And um, it's messy, but it's wonderful. And those are the encouragements, just seeing the Lord's lives. So um, praise him for that. Yeah, I mean, we see that here, don't we? God is, we're messy and God's great. Yeah. Now, behind me, there's a, can anyone tell me what is there a picture of behind me? An aeroplane. Sam, why do we have an aeroplane? Stay here, John. I'm so pleased to think this aeroplane all well. Sam and I actually had an aeroplane drawing competition this morning. He won. His was better than mine. A uh, well, well spent maths class, I, I tell you so. Um, yes, we are in 1 Corinthians 15. We're thinking about how uh, Jesus is raised, and we are raised with Jesus. So the Jesus plane is raised, and we, as we trust the Lord Jesus are united with Christ. And we are thinking about, over the coming weeks, how whatever the journey, we know where we're going, and we're thinking about the joys of being in Christ, being on the plane, traveling forwards. Little taste is kind of the weeks coming up. Every week, we're going to ask two people in the church family, don't worry, we'll give you warning, and only if you want to, something that in, that you are really glad to be on Jesus's plane. We're, we're here, we're part of Jesus's family, we're on Jesus's airplane. We can look back, say, wow, I'm so thankful about something from Easter, from the resurrection. Or wow, I'm so excited that we're gonna be with Jesus forever. Something that we're excited about on the airplane. So this week, I'm gonna ask these two, and then we're gonna take a little cheeky photo of them. So each week, we will add people from the church family onto our aeroplane. So we're all together traveling to Jesus. Okay, so Sam, you can go first while you think. Something that you've been thinking about. Something that you're excited to be on the aeroplane, Jesus' aeroplane. I think something that's exciting me is we, heaven, we know the destination is set. That's great. I will go for... Um... This is, our baggage gets left behind on this aeroplane. There's so much in my life that um, I wish I hadn't done. So many ways that I've lived for myself and not for Jesus. But he doesn't pick it up and put it on that aeroplane. He's left it behind. So praise him for that. We're going to do a Vickers So we're thinking about this, this um, thing. Now, sometimes the plane, you know, it, we're on the plane, but life can still feel very stormy and very scary. Maybe we've been on an aeroplane and it's been quite bumpy. Even still, we are safe because we are in Christ. And we're going to, we sing to get these truths that we see in God's words from our heads to our hearts, especially when life can feel bumpy. And this song we're going to sing called the Night Song really helps us particularly when life feels bumpy. Please stand as you're able and we're going to sing this song all together. sleep. 
Father in heaven, thank you so much that we are raised with Christ, safe, and you will hold us through the night all the way home. Amen. Well, we uh, please take a seat. And our Lord Jesus guides us through his words. And we come to a time where we're going as adults and as young people, we listen to our Lord Jesus in his word. We're going to split into separate groups to do that. And we're going to say these, pray these words. Uh, asking for the Lord for his help. So adults, we say together, may the words of God speak to you. Say to you, great. So the children are head on out with Alice and Kenzie. And if I could invite up to come and lead us in our press. It didn't work. It was the first time. Right. Super, Lisa, thank you. Let us pray. Our loving Father, thank you for the gift of your word that we can freely gather here together this morning on this beautiful day as a church family. And we thank you for your promise to hear us as we pray. We thank you for the reassurances that one Corinthians passage gives us today. In the name of Jesus, we come to you, thanking you for your resurrection power that raised Jesus so that death is not the end. Thank you, Lord God, that Christ lives in the hearts of all who trust in him and follow him as the Lord of life. Please help each of us in our daily lives to lift our eyes upwards, to follow Jesus and to live lives pleasing to you, that by your grace, people around us will come and follow Jesus too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord of peace, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. We pray for all world leaders, for wisdom, for courage and for strength, as they work to bring peace into our world. We pray for the changing of the hard hearts of aggressors, who perpetrate war, and we pray for a cessation of hostilities. Dear Lord, as tensions between Ukraine and Russia continue, and the devastating war continues between Israel and Gaza, we pray for the safety of all those trapped and facing starvation and disease in a place they used to call their, or they still call their home. We pray that aid and resources to help the sick, the injured and the displaced may get through safely and that, Lord, in your mercy, you hasten forward peacemakers in these areas. As we learn of new strikes overnight in Israel, we pray for all those who will be anxious in the wake of these attacks. Dear Lord, we pray that a peaceful resolution can be found between China and Taiwan so that both sides come together to resolve differences so that innocent lives are not lost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for our nation. We lift up to you King Charles and the Princess of Wales as they go through their treatment. Please be with them and with all the royal family as they seek to carry out their duties at this difficult time. We pray for our mission partners, Andy and Sophie and Noel, 
that you will be their strength and guide as they work faithfully and obediently to share the message of salvation through Jesus Christ where they live. In Jesus' name, Amen. Gracious Father, we give you great thanks for our church family here at St Paul's. Thank you for showing us, through Jesus' immeasurable love for us, how to support and to love one another. We thank you for Jeremy's continued recovery. We pray for Sue Popel and for all known to us who may be sad, frail, unwell or unsettled in any way. Please help us to share with them your gifts of caring, loving, kindness, gentleness and generosity that they too may feel the love of Christ surrounding them. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we leave this place this morning, you will keep our hearts soft and equip each of us to be truthful to your word and spirit-filled as we share this week ahead with whomever you graciously place with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lisa. It really is great to be here this morning. We love this partnership with you. And Bible reading. I wanted to tell you about a church I was reading about this week. And um, because it's a church where there are lots of exciting things going on, there are loads of new Christians. So um, what used to be quite a small church is now a growing church. And uh, as it grows, people are, are stepping into new leadership roles developing new gifts. And this church, they love their sermons. Big, powerful sermons, everyone listening attentively. And so if you walked in one Sunday to this church, it would look really exciting. But it isn't all plain sailing. To be honest, it never is with churches, but um, it really isn't in this one. This church is divided in so many ways. So you, you've got the wealthy in this church and they hang out with the wealthy and they do all they can to, to avoid hanging out with the, the poorer members of the church. Division. They've all got their own favourite preacher. And they end up arguing with each other about the sermons. That one was best. No, they're the best speaker. And then there's division over spiritual gifts. With some people claiming that they're the really spiritual ones because they've got the, the upfront gifts rather than the behind-the-scenes gifts. And everyone wants the big, showy gifts. Most recently, the division's been around sexual ethics. Who gets to decide what is morally right and what is wrong? And there's a chunk of the church, they've taken the line, well, you know, it's really important that we fit in with our surrounding culture. So they just go with whatever society tells them is right and wrong, whilst others sit in the corner tutting. You see, they might stand next to each other on a Sunday singing the same songs, but beneath the surface of this church, it's a deeply unhappy church. Some of them are even suing each other in the civil courts. And the church, you might have guessed this, the church is called the Church of Corinth. It's the church to which the Apostle Paul writes the letters of 1 and 2 Corinthians, and it's it was a messy church in so many ways. Reading through 1 Corinthians will leave you very thankful for St. Paul's Hadley Wood. And yet, we've got to ask ourselves, haven't we? You have to ask yourself, are we that different? So I'm not going to pretend to speak for St. Paul's, but I do know Christchurch pretty well. I know there are so many things that we can fall out over. That question Sam asked earlier, what are you thankful for in, in church? Well, we all care about different things in church, and that can lead to division. What kind of music should we have? What should our service be like? How long should our services be? Are the children making too much noise? Who should be baptised? Babies or just adults? Who can take communion? Can the kids? How often should we have communion? How should the gifts of the Spirit be used? Do we even believe in them? Who should preach? Is it just men or can men and women preach? And so 
the list goes on. And we're not going to do this, but I could just ask you to turn to the person next to you and discuss some of those topics. And you'll very quickly find things that you disagree with people around you on. So what do we do? What do you do when you disagree? Do you start to, to break up into little groups of those who agree with you? The spiritual group, the, the group of hymn lovers, the weekly communion takers, the only men should preach group, whatever, whatever the topic might be. It's very easy to, to gather people around us who agree with us. And the more we hear them agreeing with us, the more frustrated we become with those who disagree with us. And what happens? The divisions deepen, the rifts widen. We might stand next to each other singing praise to King Jesus on a Sunday. What, but what lies beneath the surface? How united are we really as a church? And as Sam said, this morning is the first of five sermons. Right at the end of 1 Corinthians, we're, we're dropping into chapter 15 of this letter. So here's my top tip. You might have done this already. But if you haven't, find yourself 25 or 30 minutes and read through the first 14 chapters of 1 Corinthians. And you'll see that they are 14 hard-hitting chapters, addressing divisions in the church, giving hard ethical teaching. I think it's fair to say that 1 Corinthians is packed full of some of the hardest teaching in the Bible. It, it cuts against the grain of culture. And so you, you can picture the moment when the letter arrives in Corinth and word gets round and letters come from the Apostle Paul and so everyone gathers together listening carefully would Paul take my side in the argument what's he gonna say but after the first 14 chapters of the letter have been read I reckon everyone would have been hurting they are hard words to hear you read through 1 Corinthians you can be under no illusion that following Jesus is hard it's costly. It means laying down my own personal preferences for the, for the sake of the wider church. It means going against the prevailing culture on ethical matters. There are implications for the food I eat, who I eat it with, for who to marry and whether to marry. How we respond to those in the church who are constantly disobeying God. It's hard. Following Jesus is hard. And so you can get to this point in the letter, start of chapter 15, and you could be thinking, I mean, is this worth it? Or maybe, um, is this just your opinion, Paul? C can we take it or leave it? How can we be sure? And so Paul responds with these words in chapter 15. Vanessa's going to come and read for us in just a minute. Let me pray that God would speak clearly. Uh, Father God, thank you that you are sovereign Lord. You're a God who doesn't leave us to, to guess what you are like. You speak to us. And so we pray, Father God, that you would give us soft hearts and open ears to hear your word in Christ's name. Amen. The reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 to 11 and this can be found on page 1789 of the Pew Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 starting to read at verse 1. Now brothers I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, 
most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. This is the word of the Lord. Wheeling in my props. Thank you, Vanessa, very much. I don't know if you can hear the crescendo as Paul writes those verses. There's been 14 chapters of hard but helpful teaching. But then Paul writes, verse 1, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. He's saying, come back with me to the very heart of the gospel message. Let me, let me remind you, let me proclaim to you what this is all about. Verse 3, for what I received, so he didn't make it up. It's not his opinion. It was given to him. What I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. This is foundational. That's what he's saying. He's saying this, in chapter 15, this is the main thing. Imagine these building blocks. You're wondering what my building blocks are for? Um, imagine these building blocks of all the bits that go into church life, making church happen. Because there are loads of things that go into making a church happen. You need people who are going to make the tea and coffee, people who are going to set out the, the pews, People are going to welcome you on a Sunday. People are going to do the kids teaching. You're going to have um, people caring for the grounds. I don't know if someone looks out after the flowers. You've got beautiful grounds around here. You've got um, people caring for the building. How's the building going to get looked after? You've got doctrinal teaching in the church, the doctrines of the church. You've got life group leaders. Or small group leaders, whatever you call them. What do you call them? Small group leaders. Life groups. We call them life groups. Um, you've got just the general ministry of, of turning up to a church and encouraging others. You've got people who will do the tech. You've got all these different bits that go together to form church life. But notice there are lots of building blocks here. But you can take some of these building blocks away and um, the church still standing. It's a little bit weaker, but it's still standing. But um, I trained as an engineer, so you can trust me on this one. There is one building block here which is absolutely crucial to the whole church. And it is this one right here. If you take that building block out, the whole thing is going to come tumbling down. And that's what Paul's saying. He's saying there's one key building block. Have a listen to what it is. Verse 3, what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. This one key building block is the death and resurrection of Jesus. Good Friday, Easter Sunday. That is the key to church life. And Paul's saying if you take that away, the Christian church will come crashing down. So I need a volunteer now. Who's going to come and do it? Come on, be brave. 
Brilliant. Oh, you, go on then, go on then. Take it out. Are you ready for the moment? Yeah, well, you take it out however you want to get rid of it. There we go. Sam is still in one piece, well, as much as he was anyway. And, um, but the church isn't. The church has come crashing down. Take away the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It all comes crashing down. Jesus' death and resurrection is of first importance. What I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, I was thinking about this. I was thinking, if you wanted to create your own religion, this is a crazy way to do it. Because it is so easy to tear down the Christian faith. This isn't a man going into a cave and coming out with a revelation from God. But you can't prove or disprove that. This wasn't someone claiming to meet an angel and getting a message from God. It's not a man having a private dream about God. This is a man publicly dying and publicly rising again. And if you can prove it didn't happen, then the whole of Christianity comes tumbling down. That is a crazy way to build a religion. Unless it really happened. There was a man called Lee Strobel. You might have heard of him. He was trained as a lawyer. He worked as a journalist. And one day, Lee Strobel's wife came home and told him that she had become a Christian. And he thought this was a disaster. My wife has gone mad. But he told himself, don't panic, Lee. You're trained as a lawyer. You work as a journalist. That is perfect. Let's prove this didn't happen. And so he, he went on this mission to look at all the evidence for the death and resurrection of Jesus. He was going to pull this building down once and for all, destroy the Christian faith. Do you know what happened? He became a Christian. Of course he did. He, he looked at all the evidence and he realized it really did happen. And then he wrote this fantastic little book. It's called The Case for Christ. If you've not read it, you really must. It's been turned into a film too, which you can um, watch on Amazon Prime. Because the whole of the Christian faith hangs on whether Jesus died and rose again. That's why Paul, right into the Corinthians, about 20 years after it happened, he, he keeps giving them two bits of evidence. So firstly, he says, loads of people saw Jesus after he rose again. Peter, James, Paul himself, and then more than four, 500 people all at one time. That is not a man going into a cave. 500 people saw the risen Jesus at once, which sounds worth checking out. So Paul tells them, look, it was only 20 years ago. He wrote 1 Corinthians about 20 years after Jesus' resurrection, and he tells them some of those 500 will have fallen asleep. They'll have died. But most of them are still around. Go and talk with them. Check it out because it happened. And then here's the other bit of evidence. The Old Testament, the scriptures, they said this would happen. I don't know if you heard that in the reading. Twice Paul says, according to the scriptures. Because for hundreds of years, God had been telling his prophets that this would happen. And they wrote it down. So Isaiah chapter 53 was written 700 years before Jesus was born. In fact, we've got copies of Isaiah 53 dating back to before Jesus' birth. This scroll here is called 1QLSA. Catchy name. But everyone agrees this scroll was written at least 100 years before Jesus was born. And yet this scroll contains the words of Isaiah 53 which tells us all about the Messiah's death. Prophesies what was going to happen to Jesus. Or scroll 4Q85, which is in slightly less good condition, but it still clearly contains the words of Psalm 16, which is all about how the Messiah will rise again. These things were not hidden. God told us they would happen, and he made sure that there were plenty of witnesses when it did happen. Why? Because faith in Jesus Christ, the Christian faith, it all stands or falls on this. 
For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. You see, for, for 2,000 years, the Christian faith has all been built on that one building block. And for 2,000 years, the Christian faith has stood firm, very firm. There are more Christian believers in the world today than there ever have been. And you might think, well, of course the world's getting bigger. No, not just in terms of absolute numbers, even in percentage terms. Over the last 200 years, the church has grown. And it's easy to miss that. But what we are doing here this morning is just a tiny snapshot of this global worldwide church worshipping Jesus who died and rose again. Why? Because it really happened. He really did die and rise again, not metaphorically, but physically, genuine bodily resurrection. And that changes everything. Every moment of our lives should look different because of this one truth. And that's where the rest of this letter of 1 Corinthians comes in. Paul's not saying that the last 14 chapters of 1 Corinthians don't matter. Not at all. But he's saying they all flow from this one uniting truth. Jesus died for our sins and he rose again just as God told us he would. And everything flows from that one truth. And so maybe you're someone... And um, you read through the first 14 chapters of 1 Corinthians and you're left thinking, it all does feel too hard. Following Jesus feels too costly. And it's an understandable response. But in that moment, you've got, I think you've got one of three options. You can, you can turn away. It's too hard. I'm not going to do it. You can dial it down. You can pretend that most of the Bible's teaching isn't really relevant for us today. I can live how I want because it's all about grace and forgiveness. Or you can look at the cross and the empty tomb. You can start there and you can ask yourself, did he really die for me? Does he really love me that much? Did he really rise again? Has he got that much power? Because if the answer to those questions is yes, then everything flows out from that. I mean, of course he can tell me, how to live my life. He's shown his authority. Of course I can trust him. He, he's shown me for sure that he wants the best for me. He's a joy giver, not a joy stealer. Every piece of moral teaching in the Bible has to be read in the light of the cross of Calvary and the empty tomb. I was chatting to someone who was just beginning to explore the Christian faith and they were starting to process the implications. They said to me, if I become a follower of Jesus, does that mean I have to end my relationship? I don't think I can do that. But an amazing thing happened. Because we just kept looking at the gospel story. Together we just kept looking at Jesus. And as they did that, everything changed. Because they came to believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so joyfully, they were willing to change the way they lived their lives. You can't start with the ethical teaching. Jesus' teaching makes no sense until you realise who he is and what he has done for you. Well, think about church life. Think about all the ways we can end up disagreeing and, and falling out with each other. Can you see the difference that this makes? Someone was getting cross with me the other day. This was genuine. Getting cross with me the other day because um, our church is growing and so the, the back of church was quite crowded as they came in and they were trying to get into church and they were saying, why is everyone in my way? Someone else was complaining because the kids were making too much noise during the sermon. Our kids stay in for the whole of the service at Christ Church. And you can get those struggles, but they've lost the sight of Calvary's cross and the empty tomb. Because shouldn't they be left thinking, isn't it incredible that more people are getting to hear about Jesus' death and resurrection. How awesome that our children can be learning alongside us as part of our journey of faith. Sometimes it becomes, um, I don't like that song, I don't like that hymn, it's too modern, it's too old-fashioned, whatever it might be. 
but it could be how fantastic that we have these words to sing our praise to our Saviour who died and rose again. It might be the other way around, because it could become, what a brilliant preacher Sam is. He's simply excellent. And, and the focus has shifted, because it should be what an amazing gospel message God has given to us. How grateful we are to God that he's given us someone to keep reminding us of it. You see, the Christian life, every aspect of your life flows out from the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And that's not to say the other bits of life don't matter. 1 Corinthians actually makes abundantly clear they do matter all the more. But when the details themselves become of first importance, churches will pull themselves apart. We'll end up warring. But Jesus died. Jesus rose again. And everything flows out from that one great gospel truth. What I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. Let me lead us in a prayer. Eternal God, how we praise you for your son, for his love that led him to the cross, and for, for his power that conquered the grave. And we pray, I pray, Father God, that Jesus would be the centre of our churches and the centre of our lives, that those great truths, historical truths, which impact our lives in so many ways, please, would they be our centre, the foundation on which St Paul's Hadley Wood, Christ Church Cot Fosters, and each of our lives is built upon. To the praise and glory of Jesus we ask. Amen. John, thank you so much. We have been encouraged by the Lord from his words, you know, as we've heard. And now we celebrate that same word, that same gospel in the bread and the wine at the Lord's Supper. There's a flow to uh, communion, the Lord's Supper, that we'll see at the bottom of the slides coming up. Uh, and we start by saying sorry to God for the ways we've treated God and others. Then we remind each other where we find forgiveness. We see Jesus, he, he rose, he died and rose, goes into his forever family. We, we thank God, we praise God for his mercy and love. Then we come to share in the family meal. and We look forward to the great and final party. We start by saying sorry. Take a moment and then I invite you to follow along the words in yellow. And then when words in white pop up, I'll, I'll lead us in those. Together we confess to God, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate faults. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Hear the words of comfort our Saviour Christ says to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places 
to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. All glory to you, our Heavenly Father. In your tender mercy, you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made there a full atonement for the sins of the whole world, offering once for all his one sacrifice of himself. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. In the same night that he was betrayed, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. So come, celebrate. The welcomers, uh, stewards, will direct you up. Um, our pattern here is to come to the front to fan out in a semicircle. The bread and the wine are passed round. There's a gluten free option, a non alcoholic option as well, if you prefer. And when the semicircle um, has finished, uh, I'll lead us in affirming those words from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. Christ died for our sins. Christ died for our sins. And then I'll invite us back to our seats and the next group can come up. Uh, some music will play. It reminds us of the victory in Jesus' death and resurrection. It's a song we sang, if you were here on Good Friday, what he's done at the cross. If you're unable to come forwards, but would love to celebrate with us, please do make yourself known to the stewards and we can come to you towards the end. So come celebrate. This is Jesus's family meal. It's for all those who want a place at Jesus's family table now and forever. You don't have to be confirmed, but on our way to confirmation is good. If you're here, you're just visiting, and you're used to taking communion in your own church, you're most welcome to celebrate with us. Maybe we're here and we're still thinking a lot of this God stuff through. It's absolutely fine to stay in your seat. Please feel no embarrassment. But consider, who else forgives our sins? Who else defeats death? If you're a younger part of our church family and your parents are happy for you to celebrate with us, uh, there are grapes as well. If you'd just like me to pray for you, I'd love to do that. Leave your hands by your sides. So I will invite you, draw near with faith. Receive the spiritual food of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Feed on him in your heart by faith and with great thanksgiving.
on the hill of Calvary. My Savior bled for me. My Jesus set me free. And look at the wounds that give me life. Grace flowing from His side. No greater sacrifice. What He's done.
I'll lead us in a prayer and then you can join me. I invite you to join me with the words up on the screen. I'll pray this first. Himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may see him in all his redeeming work, who is alive and reigns now and forever. Amen. And together we say this prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out into the world in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. The Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hear these words again from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, foundational, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Our final hymn reminds us of Jesus dying and rising again. As the music begins, uh, please stand as we're able to sing and declare our confidence in Christ alone.
stand a final prayer. Almighty Father, who in your great mercy gladden the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give us such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you all forevermore. Amen. Please do take a seat. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, John, for encouraging us from God's words. Uh, we have tea and coffee um, through here. I do encourage you to filter on through. Um, uh, and here's a question that John has given us uh, to be able to keep encouraging each other, eyes fixed on Jesus. What difference will it make to your Monday morning that Jesus died and rose again? What difference will it make to your Monday morning that Jesus died and rose again? Thank you. Well done. What do you got there? Right.